Sounding Board, a presentation of Seroptimist International of Novato, whose mission it is to improve the lives of girls and women locally and globally. Sounding Board is completely produced by members of Seroptimist International of Novato. I'm Freda Kaplan, and it's my pleasure to have as our guest tonight, Jen Chea, who is a trainer at Guide Dogs for the Blind. Hello, Jen. Hello, Freda. Welcome to our show. Thank you. I wanted to ask you what you do at Guide Dogs. Well, my title is I'm a Senior Guide Dog Mobility Instructor. I train dogs to work with blind people, and then I work with the blind people to teach them how to use the dogs. They use the dogs to get around independently, so the dogs are trained to lead them. And I see you have a guide dog with you tonight. I do. This is Augusta. She's sleeping. Augusta. <laughs> how old is she? She's about a year and a half. And so then she's fully grown? She is fully grown. And she's what kind of dog? She is a Labrador Retriever, and she's a yellow Labrador Retriever, even though she's a little bit reddish in tone. They come in several different shades of yellow. She seems a little small for the Labradors. That's why I asked. How much does she weigh? She weighs close to 60 pounds. She is pretty small for a Labrador, but we breed them small at guide dogs because people like to have smaller guide dogs to travel on public transportation and to get into under tables when they're in restaurants. I'm going to get her up because she seems to have fallen over on my foot. Augusta, sit. There you go. That's good. Just stay right there. How long does it take to train a do guide dog, and, and what does that include? Well, the dog's tr formal training with me starts when they're about a year and a half old, and that takes about 10 to 12 weeks, and they are trained to lead people from point A to point B and not to run them into anything, and they also stop at curbs. They are supposed to travel in a straight line, until they are instructed by the blind person to do something else, like turn, for example. I'd like to see you demonstrate some of the things that you and Augusta could do. Okay, I'll happily demonstrate some turns for you. Good. Good, so first I'm going to demonstrate the left turn. I'm going to use footwork, a hand gesture, and a verbal cue. Watch how Augusta responds. Augusta, left. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. All right, let's go. Heel, heel. And now I'm going to demonstrate the left turn, but I'm not going to give the left command. I'm just going to use footwork and a hand gesture. So you can see that Augusta responds even without saying the word left because she recognizes my footwork and my hand gesture. Now I'll show you with the right turn. Augusta, right. Good girl, good girl. Now I'm going to demonstrate the right turn without saying right. Girl, very good. Now I'd like to demonstrate how we teach the dogs to find chairs for our clients. Now this is how we actually train them. In the end, the person will not need to click the dog or put their hand on the chair and the dog will take them right to the chair. But this is how the process starts. Chair. Good. Good girl. Come here. Augusta, find the chair. Good girl. Very nice. Good girl. Good job. Yeah. 
can you train other kinds of dogs um, to be guide dogs and can you tra use the same kind of training with other animals? Yes, in fact Guide Dogs for the Blind currently uses mostly Labradors, but we also use Golden Retrievers and a Golden Retriever Labrador Retriever Cross. We used to train German Shepherds, in fact that's what we started with, and many schools still use German Shepherds, and you can train any kind of animal using the techniques that we do. You can't necessarily train them to be a guide or a guide dog, but you can use the techniques to train all kinds of behaviors in all kinds of animals. How has training evolved at guide dogs? Well, that's um, pretty exciting for me because it, when I first started there, we didn't use any food in our training. And mostly we used just verbal commands and praise and corrections with the leash. So we've really evolved to concentrate on positive reinforcement. And so we use food to capture the behavior that we want by rewarding it. So the more times a dog is rewarded for a behavior, the more likely it is that he's going to perform that behavior again. So we, we show them the behavior and then we wait for them to do it again and we reward them for it. Well, in addition to training the dogs, I assume you have to teach the people as well. That's right. So wh what do you do? Well, they come in for training um, and they stay with us anywhere from two to three weeks and we will take them to all kinds of different areas um, and show them how to work their dog in several different kinds of environments. Um, and also we'll show them how to teach their dogs new things, like how to locate items, such as chairs or pedestrian walk buttons. And then when the person gets home with their dog, they can actually teach their dog how to find things for them. Um, if the dog needs to be retrained or if the person is having a problem after they've left guide dogs, what do you do then? Uh, we provide lifetime follow-up service. We call it follow-up service. And that means that if someone is having any trouble or has any questions about their dog or the dog develops a health problem or behavior problem, they can call us at any time. And we have a special department dedicated to advising them. Um, and then also, if needed, a trainer like myself could be sent to their home to work with them and work with and um, retrain their dog if need be, or help them retrain their dog, or help them learn a new route in a new area. So like if somebody moves to a new place, we'll go and help them get oriented to their area. And in addition to this, we provide just routine follow-up visits. So we go, we visit every area once a year and we'll call you and see if you need us to come visit you um, and for the first couple of years of your life together with your guide dog we would actually just come and visit just to check up and make sure that everything was going okay. What a wonderful service. It really is. And yeah. that's all part of your initial getting the dog. That's right. It's all provided for free by our services. So they just come and they get the dog, we give them the dog, and then if they need any help for the rest of their lives, we provide that free of charge. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah. And what about if the person outlives the dog, then do they come and be get retrained again or it depends on how old the dog is because you don't we don't want to necessarily give someone a dog who isn't going to last for a good long time so if a dog was young enough if they were say three years old we might consider retraining them it depends on what kind of history they had and we would want them to be pretty stellar at their job in order to make it worth someone's while to get an older dog so we could retrain them but if they weren't going to be retrained then we would rehome them we take full responsibility for the dog for their entire Higher lives. And what do you mean by rehome? I mean we would find, we would offer the dog first to their puppy raisers, the people who raised them when they were puppies and socialized them and loved them and gave them a home. Uh, we would offer them to the puppy raisers. If the puppy raisers didn't want to adopt them themselves, or they couldn't for some reason, then they would be able to offer the dog to one of their friends or relatives if that's something that interested them and then if that wasn't a possibility we would find the right home for the dog we have we have uh, applications that are waiting uh, for career change dogs which is what we call the dogs who don't make it
because it's a different career, but it's still a job. But they're still working. Uh, they work as pets, some of them. There are actually some dogs who end up going to programs such as um, Dogs for Diabetics, which is a program over in Concord, and they train the dogs to, to recognize changes in people's blood sugar, diabetic people's blood sugar, so that they can alert people before something you know, before something bad happens so that the person can adjust their blood sugar appropriately. Um, we also send dogs to programs for search and rescue who don't make it as guide dogs. And we send dogs to, um, we have a special program called Canine Buddies where we match the dogs up, really special dogs, get matched up with um, young blind children who aren't old enough to get a guide dog yet but they can learn how to care for and interact with and just generally how to do obedience with a, a dog to find out if getting a guide dog for them when they're older is right for them and just to learn responsibility and for the companionship. What a wonderful program. It is, yeah. It's very wonderful. How did you get interested in dog training? Well, I've always loved dogs ever since I was little, but when I was about 11, I started raising puppies myself. So I was in a club in Contra Costa County, and we uh, raised guide dog puppies. My family, I say we, because it was a family effort. And we took them to school, and we went to meetings. And I originally had thought maybe I wanted to be a veterinarian when I grew up. But after my experience with raising guide dog puppies, I knew I wanted to be a guide dog trainer because it just gave me the opportunity to uh, work with dogs, healthy, happy dogs, and really make a difference in people's lives. So when I graduated from high school, I went to college at UC Davis, and I graduated with a degree in psychology and an emphasis on animal behavior. And then I applied to work in the kennels at Guide Dogs, and when an opportunity arose, I applied to be an apprentice. Um, you have to be an apprentice for three years before you can become an actual Guide Dog instructor. So. I completed the apprenticeship in 2007, and in California, you actually have to be licensed to train guide dogs. So I also took a state exam and got my license, and I renew it every year by taking um, credits, educational credits. That was hard work. <laughs> it was hard work. Yeah. yeah, it's very hard work. It's very rewarding work. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, speaking of work. I keep wondering, do guide dogs play? They're working dogs, so do they get to play? I'm glad you asked. It's very important for a dog to play. It's at least as important for a dog to play as it is for them to work. The training it is, all learning is stressful inherently, and so the chance to play is an important part of their psychological well-being. So they really do need to play. And actually, we teach them how to play if they don't know how to play appropriately because it's something that can really build the bond between them and the person that they go to live with ultimately, which is usually a blind client. I want to ask you about the harness. Um, Guide Dogs has been around for 70 years here. Mm -hmm. Have they always used harnesses? Well, the harness developed pretty early on in guide dog training. I think I think probably the very first guide dogs trained in Europe, they started with leashes, but Sue found that it wasn't very easy to follow a dog just using a leash. Um, so they developed the harness in Switzerland mm. is where the first harnesses were developed. And the first harnesses that guide dogs for the blind use were, in fact, the same harnesses that were developed in Switzerland. And they were made there. And they were made by um, one man. He would make them all to order. And um, recently, his son, who he had passed the business on to, retired. And we had to find a new source for our harnesses. So we developed, um, we have a Department of Research and Development. And they worked very hard and found the right kind of materials. They sampled several different types. Um, and this harness body in particular that Augusta is wearing is specifically made to allow her free movement in her forelimbs. And then the harness handle itself, this white piece here with the reflection on it, is made to be very visible so that when a person is traveling with their dog, they can be seen pretty easily. So we worked hard to develop that. It's also much lighter than our old harness, which had a lot more leather and heavy metals in it. And so it feels better to the dog and to the person using the harness. 
I never thought about it, but the harness does identify the dog to people, and so they have a different respect for them. They do, yeah, so that they know not to just pet them or distract them. And also, I, you know, when, when someone's crossing the street, it's good if someone can see that they're standing with the guide dog instead of just mm -hmm. a regular dog, because maybe they'll be more likely to stop and let them cross the street. Is it appropriate or proper to ask if you can pet a guide dog? It is very appropriate to ask. It is not appropriate to just walk up to them and pet them without asking. So I have a rule when I'm working with a dog. If someone asks me and it's possible, I will let them pet the dog. Because I think that it's very important to allow people to interact with the dog, for the dog to learn good behavior. But if, uh, if you ever interact with someone who is actually blind and using a guide dog, they might have their own idea of whether you should pet their dog or not. And also the dog needs to be concentrating on their work. It's very... It's safety. It's a safety issue, so you don't want to distract a dog who's in charge of someone's safety. So I, I would say always ask first, but by all means ask if you want to. And usually um, you should ask when they're in a resting position or if they're stopped, not when they're in motion. Yeah, because imagine if you're trying to get to work and someone is hey, can I pet your dog, or hey, can I check out your handbag, <laughs> you know? I mean, not that a dog is a handbag, but people people have places to be, important things to do in their lives, and so, yeah, when they're going somewhere is not the ideal time to ask if you can pet them, but, you know, if they're standing at a curb or sitting in a restaurant or shopping at a store standing still, it might be a good time to ask. Do you have well-trained pets at home? I have... Um, one dog who actually was a career change from guide dogs. She's a German Shepherd. She's about 11 now, and she's very well behaved and very well trained. And I also have a cat who I trained with the techniques that I learned by working at guide dogs. So I used a clicker to train him. He knows a few things. He knows how to come when he's called. The cat. Yes, the cat. And he knows how, if I point at a chair, how to jump on it or point at anything else for that matter. He jumps on it. Um, and he can also wave, and he also knows how to dance on his he back. He waves. Two paws. Yes, he does. <laughs> and dance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a cat. <laughs> yeah. I thought it would be a good idea to practice the techniques on my cat before I started using them on guide dogs, so I, I just had a good time practicing timing and all that with the clicker. How interesting. Yes. Can people learn to use the clickers on, for themselves, for their dogs and cats? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's, it's quite a fun technique for your dog. And so that's the beauty of this training method is that it's fun for both the human and the dog. Um, and so, or the any animal for that matter. And so I would recommend it to anyone who's interested in um, clicker training to check out clickertraining.com. Um, in fact, one of the people in our research and development department works for them, with them. And so we have a pretty close relationship, Guide Dogs for the Blind, with the clicker training world. Um, and I've actually been sent to several conferences for my work. But yeah, if you're interested, they have all kinds of materials there. They, they can refer you to classes in your home area for working with your pets and and they have advice on working with all kinds of different animals including goldfish if you can believe it you can train your goldfish to jump through a hoop using this method so wow a trained <laughs> goldfish you could do anything you yes could... yes <laughs> that's interesting <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> in addition to the clicker i noticed that you were um, rewarding augusta with kibble exactly yes so there, um, the clicker is specifically for teaching brand new behaviors. So once a dog knows the responses that I'm expecting from her, I don't, I can not use the clicker anymore. But I will still reward her, not all the time, but every so often with some food to keep those responses strong and so that she keeps wanting to do them. It's, it's to motivate her. And she's very motivated. She is, isn't she? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not at the moment, necessarily. <laughs> no, she's worked hard. She's a working dog at rest. Yes, she is. <laughs> is there anything else that you could tell us that I have forgotten to ask you about guide dogs or dog training? 
Yes, well, I think that one of the most interesting things is how we, in training, we take them to all kinds of different areas. So you'll frequently see us guide dog instructors in San Rafael because that's where the school is, but we also go to San Anselmo and Mill Valley and then most importantly to San Francisco. Um, and we teach them how to ride the city bus. We have them ride the city bus on Chestnut Street usually. And we teach them how to lie politely in restaurants, which is probably one of the more impressive things for pet dog owners to see. And we also teach them um, something called intelligent disobedience. So after we've taught them to respond appropriately to commands, we then teach them how to not perform the command when it's unsafe to do so. So an example of that would be if you are at a street crossing and you command your dog forward, but a car cuts you off, the dog will not respond to the forward command. He, she will stop you there at the curb and not go. And a, similarly, in mid-crossing, even if the dog has already said, gone forward after you give the command, they're trained to stop and hold their position until it's safe even if the person doesn't realize that the car is there and is pushing the dog to go, they should hold their position and we train them to do that. And also um, subway platforms. So we go to BART and we teach the dogs that even if they're told to make a turn or go forward towards the edge of the platform, they will not go up to it. They, they're trained to pull the person away from it regardless of what the person tells them to do. Because oftentimes a, a subway platform can be very disorienting for someone who can't see because the noises are so concentrated and there's just a lot of different things going on. So it's easy to get turned around and think you're facing something safe that you do want to go towards and direct your dog towards it when it's actually the platform edge. So the dog has to be trained not to respond in those situations and to stop the person from going over the edge. But when the train comes and the door opens, then they get right they on go forward. Yeah, exactly. Well, that seems to be the ultimate test of, of a guide dog. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. 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 Um, how about elevators? That seems like that might be strange. Yeah, we do. We teach them to ride on escalator uh, elevators and escalators, escalators. In fact, yes, we do. Um, so the main thing they have to do to find an elevator is just to locate it, and then we train them to point their noses at the button so that the person can find it easily and push the button. So they feel the nose and where the dog's nose yeah, is? Yeah, well, because a person a person who's been trained to work with a guide dog is, is trained how to follow the guide dog. And so they will follow the guide dog, and then when the dog stops, they'll line right up with where the guide dog's head is so that they'll know what the dog's pointing at. So then they easily find whatever it is they're showing. And this is similar when the dog shows them a door. The dog is trained to point at the handle of the door and to the open part of the door, not to the hinge and not to the middle of the door, but to where the person can open the door. So, and then <clears throat> when the elevator comes, they wait patiently in, until people come off, if there's people on the elevator, and then they'll take you right on to the elevator and sit politely until you get to your floor and then take you right off. That is intelligence training. <laughs> it is, it is. And then they also ride escalators, so they show the people the handle, of the, the handrail of the escalator so they can make sure that they're getting on the right direction because they don't want the ones that are coming towards them. And then the dog will wait patiently for the person to get, get ready and then they'll get on the escalator and they'll stand still and just wait until they get to the top and then they'll jump off to protect their feet. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> they jump off the escalator, they yeah. know that. Yeah, we train them that, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, and then they also work in, there's lots of interesting things that they do in buildings um, because they have to negotiate a lot more obstacles and the line of travel can be very diluted and they can't necessarily see where they're going. So, for example, if you're in a department store, you might be in there one day and the displays are set up in a certain way and it would be very natural for a dog to expect it to be exactly the same the next day, but we all know that department stores don't stay the same. They change their displays, so the dog has to be prepared for a dynamic environment and moving around the obstacles. Um, additionally, in those kinds of settings, there's pedestrians 
who are probably the toughest obstacle to clear because they're very unpredictable. You uh, imagine a dog walking behind a pedestrian on a cell phone, for example, and they aren't paying any attention to the dog and they might just stop suddenly or move to the left or the right and the dog has to be able to make, to be paying attention enough to stop or to move around the person if possible. So without running the client into the pedestrian. So. There's a lot to this training. There is. It's quite, it's quite complex. And the other really important thing that the dog has to do is to maintain a good working attitude amidst many distractions. So if you have a pet dog, you probably know that dogs like food on the ground. Dogs like other dogs. Dogs like squirrels. Dogs like cats. So anytime they encounter that in their environment, it can be very distracting. They pretty much stop listening to you. Well, these dogs have to learn to just maintain focus on their work um, regardless of what environment they're in. So that's another really important reason that we take them to so many different environments so that they can experience lots of different things. These dogs are so accomplished. This has been a fascinating time listening to you talk and watching the dog. Th thank you so much for coming here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, this thank was you for great. having me. You're welcome. I want to say thanks to our Seroptimus crew and to Rick Tucker and Leon Johnson of Novato Public Access Television. They've helped us with our production, once again, of Sounding Board. <laughs>